And David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with them in Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord, that is Jehovah of hosts, that dwells between the cherubim. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahiah, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahiah went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord with all manner of instruments made of fir, wood, even of harps, and on psalteries, timbrels, cornets, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God to take hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Peruzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, uh, How shall it come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord and to him in the city of David. And David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertains to him because the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom, the city of David, with gladness. And it was as they bare the ark of the Lord, they had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And David was girded with the linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. We have the familiar story here of the bringing up of the ark of God into the land of Israel. You will remember that in the days of Eli, this ark that God had commanded Moses to make, it had been stolen by the Philistines when Hophni and Phinehas decided that they were going to go running headlong into battle with this ark over their shoulders. And God did not command them to do it. As a matter of fact, they went out there thinking superstitiously that somehow this ark is going to help us to win the battle. But how many of you know the power is not just in the emblem or the item itself? The power is in the Spirit of God and in the obedience that they were expected to be moving in. Hophni and Phinehas were exceedingly wicked. As a matter of fact, God warned the house of Eli. He said that I'm going to judge you because you would not restrain your sons and you basically set them up over me and you treated them uh, with obedience rather than me. And so what ended up happening? They went out into battle. The Philistines took the ark and a messenger came back to Eli with word. He said that your sons have been killed and this is what God said was going to happen and the ark has been taken. And when that happened, Eli fell over, broke his neck, and died. He was the high priest at the time. And one of the uh, wives of one of the boys who was killed immediately went into labor, and she gave birth to a child. And you will remember that they named the child Ichabod, meaning that the glory of the Lord is departed. And it was a tremendously sad day in Israel. I mean, you would, you would be mortified to think that they would do such a thing and that the ark of God could have ever possibly have been taken. But once the ark was in the land of the Philistines, God began bringing judgment upon them. And one of the judgments that he brought was, pardon the expression, hemorrhoids. And believe me, by the time God got through with them, they were ready to get rid of this ark. So they went to the soothsayers and they went to the priest and they asked everybody, you know, what should we do? And they said, well, you need to make some golden emeralds, okay? And you need to make some golden mice and all these plagues and you need to put it in a box and you need to put this ark up on a brand new cart and have two cows that have never had a yoke put across them. And see, what they were doing sounded like it made a whole lot of sense. 
It's like, you know, ooh, this sounds really spiritual. We'll put it on a brand new cart. And we'll get some cows that never had a yoke put on them. And they pulled it all the way into where it was supposed to be. It was more like they made a beeline right where they were supposed to go. And then they stopped. And the scripture said that the men who got it took that cart. They broke it up in pieces. And they used the wood for the kindling. And they used the animals to make sacrifice to the Lord there. So they burned up this ark. Or this cart, rather. And then they put the ark in the house of Bimelech. So what ended up happening? It was there for 20 years. Now imagine that. When you're around something for that long, even something that is really spiritual, how many of you know you can get used to it? There's an old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. And they got familiar with this ark being around. I don't doubt it. Maybe they didn't bump into it every once in a while. Oh, let's move it out of the way. Let's push it over here. And let's do that. And they got used to doing things with this ark that would have been unthinkable back in the time of Moses. And so finally the day came where David was like, you know what? We need to bring the ark of the Lord back up into the city. We need to get it back up here. And what did they do? They followed the same pattern that the Philistines did. And they put the ark up on a cart and they began re uh, carrying it uh, into the land. And it reached Nashon's threshing floor. And the scripture said it began to wobble back and forth. And the instinct of those that were going with it, because these were priests, Uzzah being one of the sons of Abimelech, and they lived in that house. He would have been one of the people that was around this ark for 20 years all the time. Reached up and put his hand on that ark, and God smote him dead right where he stood. And the fear of the Lord came upon David. It upset him greatly, and they wanted to know what was the reason, why did this happen? Why did he, God smite him dead like he did? Well, it was a simple answer, saints. And that answer works like this. The ark was never to be carried on a cart. It was never to be carried on a cart. It was to be carried by four of the priests on their shoulders. As a matter of fact, there were these two poles that would slide through rings on the side of the ark. They would slide both of the poles through. One person would get on this side, one on this side, then one on the back and one on the corner. And these four men would stand up and they would walk and they would carry the ark everywhere that it was supposed to go. And that was the way it was supposed to be. No machinery, no mechanisms, no new things. It's this, what God said. No new cart, no new cows, no new strange whatever that you think that maybe God will accept. But he has already spoken, he has already said that when you carry my presence, when you carry the symbol of my presence, when you carry the symbol of my throne, it must be carried on the shoulders of the priests. And saints, listen, these things were written for our learning. They were written for our admonition. These things were only ever just a picture. It was just a symbol. Just like the blood of the lamb that they put on the mercy seat was only a symbol of the blood of Jesus. The ark of God was only a symbol of God's authority and God's presence in the midst of God's people. And saints, listen, nothing has changed. It still must be carried on the shoulder of the priests. And we are a kingdom of priests unto God. Saints, I feel the Lord telling us as a church, we've got to come up higher. Amen. Amen. We've been down here. We've got to come up higher. You know, I'm ready to preach and teach messages I'm used to teaching and preaching, which are messages along this line, which means we've got to come up higher. We've got to elevate the message. We've got to elevate the meeting. We've got to elevate the manifest presence of God in our Amen. meetings, Amen. which means that each one of us as individuals as members of the kingdom of God, as members of the priesthood 
that God has commissioned us to be are to be shouldering our end of the ark in the meeting. How many of you are still with me? I'm probably going to lose everybody tonight. We've got to carry the service, if you like, on the shoulders of the priests. Did you know, saints, that every service that, that has ever been, no matter whether I was in the home church, whether I was on a street corner, whether I was in a nursing home, whether I was in England, whether it's in Nebraska, Oklahoma, I don't care where I have been. There has been a burden, there has been a weightiness to that meeting that had to be carried by the people that were in that meeting. Because otherwise, that meeting is going to fall flat on its face the moment that you start. It's going to fall flat on its face. And sometimes, while I'm up here ministering, I can tell there are people that God is dealing with. That their soul could be weighing in the balance. And I'm just hoping, I'm just praying that somebody would just be interceding in that service so that God will give us the breakthrough. Because how many of you know, I can't preach and intercede. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I can preach, but I can't intercede. I'm just one person. And saints, how crazy would it have looked if just one person would have tried to shoulder that ark? You see, that's why it had to go on a cart. Because you know what? I'm not carrying it. But you know what? I, I tried to pick that. Have you ever try to lift that? No, no, let's just try to get it up on this cart. When we were picking up this organ yesterday, we had to load that into the back of a truck. So the guy's like, hey, why don't we just put, why don't we just put the, 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 the back of my trailer up against the, the ramp, up against your the back of your truck, that created an angle like this for us to carry that organ up. And I thought, well, Lord, here goes nothing. But how many of you know we couldn't have done that with just one person? There was four people there to move that thing. And saints, listen, a service is just like that. It takes everybody, especially the spiritual folks, to be pulling in that service. To be pulling the load of that service. There are times when I may go, go out of the service. I'll ask my wife, how did you feel like the service went? And she always says and encourages me, oh, I think it went great. But the whole time I'm going, well, you know, I don't know, you know. We, uh, you know. I was in a service one time and a pastor began expressing this. And, and this has been 30 years, maybe 25. And he said, yeah. He said, you know, this service feels like, and I mean, he's tearing it up. He's an old time Pentecost preacher. You know, he's not like me. I'm kind of a teacher. He's, you know, he's thundering. He's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, he's like, it's like I'm pulling the wagon up the hill and I'm expecting everybody in the service to be pushing with me. And he said, and I look back and you're all right. Yeah. You say, well, Brother Robert, how can you help me? How can we help this service? I'll tell you how. Live spiritual all week. Because you bring a week's worth of living into a meeting. You can't get spiritual on the parking lot. Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit right now. I'm about to go through the door. See, that's not how it works. We have to be spiritual all week. If we live a life that's pleasing to God all week, we'll be on fire for God. We'll come into the meeting. We're looking to see God move. We can't wait to get into the service to see what God is going to do. Because we've been living for God all week. Uh, last, last night, my wife was trying to get in the car and I said, start her up. And she says, it's not working. It's not working. I was like, oh boy, here we go again. You know, we have to get the mechanics equipment out. She goes, look at the keys, the red lights on. I said, red lights on? That's weird. Didn't even know it had a red light. I thought, I know what's wrong. The batteries are dead. That key, saints, I can click, boom, right here, and it will unlock my car from here, provided the batteries are charged. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? If that battery isn't charged, I can't even get it to start the car, much less unlock the door. 
And saints, listen, we need to come into this service charged up and ready to have church. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit and we need to be ready to let God use us. I'm, I'm taken by the fact that, you know, Peter and John, you know, they're, they're, they arrive at this man at the gate, beautiful. They're on their way to church. Do you notice that? They're on their way to the meeting, not on their way home. Now, they didn't come dragging into the meeting. Oh, I just barely made it. The devil's been after me, bless his dear sweet name. And here I am. That's not where they were, saints. You know where they were? Here was their spirituality. Look on us. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Uh -huh. yes. And the Bible said he stood to his feet and he began to jump and praise God. When they were leaving church, when they were on their way to church. Right. Yes. They were full of the Holy Ghost. They were ready to do business for God. Why? Because they were bringing a week's worth of living to that gate. Saints, listen. This meeting is never going to be more spiritual than the combined total of all of us. Unless God just miraculously comes down and blesses us, it's not going to rise any higher than our spiritual life. I realize it starts with me. As the pastor of the church, it begins just right here. And if we want to see God move, if we want to see God move powerfully, I think about Paul. Imagine this. He's in Ephesus. He said, I fought with beasts in Ephesus. I mean, he had a hard time. Think of that. That's how he characterized his experience. I fought with beasts there. I mean, they tried to kill him and everything else. He's going to the meeting, to a prayer meeting. And what happened? Here's this woman. She looks back at Paul. She keeps telling him over and over again. Telling them things like this, saying things like this. These men be servants of the Most High God and show us the way of salvation. And just keep saying it. And that's a true statement. But that woman was demon possessed. She was demon possessed. And she had made her soothsayers rich off her soothsaying. But at some point, God gave Paul discernment. And he looked and he saw the demon possession. And he told that demon, come out of her. And that demon left that woman. Yes. To the point to where these other sons, seven sons of Siva thought, you know, we can do that too. Well, there's one of Paul. There's seven of us. Yep. We ought to be able to get it done. Well, that was a new cart because they didn't even know the Lord. Yeah. Hmm? That's right. They told a demon-possessed person, they said, we adjure thee by Jesus whom Paul preached. That sounded good. Right up until they got beat up. And they got their clothes tore off of them. And sent out naked and wounded. By one man. He said, here's what he said. Paul I know. And Jesus I know. He used two different Greek words. But who are you? Who are you? Saints listen. We can't be telling the devil what to do if we're not obeying God. That's right. That's right. Amen. If, if, we, if we live for ourselves all week, how are we going to come in here and rebuke some demon off of somebody? And people are going to come into these church services bound up. They're going to be in bondage. And saints, listen, we've got to be spiritual. We've got to shoulder the load of the meeting. I remember... When I was a young Christian, I'm, I could go on all night, so, but I'm just going to I'm just going to end with this tonight because I think you, you get what I'm saying. Before I ever had any ministry, before I even was a Sunday school teacher, I had nothing that I was doing for the Lord. I wasn't even an assistant Sunday school teacher. You know what my heart's desire was? It was to pray and to seek God particularly for the services. I wasn't going to preach, but I would show up sometimes an hour or more before church. And I would go down in this little room down in the home church. 
Me and several other of the young men, none of us had ministries. We didn't even play an instrument. We weren't on the platform. And you know what we would do? We would intercede for that meeting. How many of you know what intercession is? We would intercede for that meeting. We would pray. Sometimes we would be on our knees. Sometimes we would be up walking around addressing the forces of darkness. Lord, we bind the enemy that's going to try to disrupt this service. We come against the devil before he ever comes. Lord, send him from the north, the south, the east, and the west into this meeting, Lord. And when we would go upstairs after that, God would move powerfully in those services. He would move into worship. You say, Brother Robert, why were you doing it? The Lord just laid it on our heart. I couldn't do anything else. But I enjoyed doing that. And we would pray. And saints, God, I can tell you, God used me outside the four walls of the church more in those days than he even does today. Even today. I don't know how many people that I met on the streets that I ministered to. I remember one time there was a gentleman getting ready to commit suicide and jump off the side of a bridge at one o'clock in the morning. And God said, stop and talk to that man. It's like, Lord, it's late. I've had a bad day. Can't do it, Lord. Not tonight. And I say, I'll just call the police. No, nope. this went on like three times. Finally, I said, okay, Lord. I whipped the truck around. I went back. I didn't have time to say, well, let me get down to the side of the truck. I need to pray through first. That's right. Hmm? Yeah. How many of you know when my phone rings, it can't be, hold on just a minute. Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. <laughs> That's right. Amen. That's right. It's true. It can't be that. No. It's got to be, hold on, let's pray. In the name of Jesus. I've got to be instant. And saints, listen, if we all come into the meeting instant, ready to be used, not because we have a ministry, but because we care about what God wants to do in a service. Are you mindful of what God wants to do in a service? When you're sitting back there, are you thinking, Brother Robert's preaching, but I know this person over here really needs a touch from God. This person over here, I know God's going, to, God's going to do something here. Are you sensitive to that? Are you aware of what God's wanting to do in the service? Because saints, listen, I'm just one person. I can't pull this whole load. It's too big. It's too much. We all have to work. And we can't put it on a cart. We can't use machinery. We've got to do it as God wants us to do it. I just want to pray tonight. I just want to pray.